Hi, everybody. And thanks, Boing Boing. It's great to be here. Uh, we are going to the moon. And we're even going to go to Mars by the very end. We'll make a journey outbound, starting with the electron and going to the solar system. And this is a Ford Motor recruitment advertisement from 1960, from a period of time when Ford Motor Company was a contractor to NASA. This is a history talk, uh, traveling through art, exploring the synergy um, between the creative work of artists and the creative work of engineers. Uh, we'll travel from the 1940s through the 1960s. So a tour of technology through the work of visual artists. Yes, I'm going to show you how the journey from the electron to the solar system was drawn by hand, by artists and by engineers in synergy. As we go, we'll see art and engineering drawing from one another. In the 1920s, when the structure of the atom was being explored by scientists, scientists noticed a parallel between the structure of the atom with orbital rings around a nucleus and the structure of the solar system. Artists paid attention to what scientists were doing and by the 1940s had adapted scientific concepts to a highly refined applied art. Uh, commercial artists were often the uh, clients of companies making applied electronic technologies, such as Herbert Byer's work for General Electric, as here. One of the earliest pieces of applied electronic technology is, of course, the vacuum tube. And here, our planet is encased within a tube. This particular type of tube was a radio tube from the 1930s to, developed to enable a more far-reaching long-distance broadcast network than had ever existed before. Now, as the telephone had done in the 1880s, the radio dramatically expanded the human sense of scale by conveying the sound of a voice for hundreds of miles. Unlike the telephone, which had connected one voice to another, the radio spoke to millions at once. From the beginning, electronic components extended the human sense array. The vacuum tube among the senses corresponds to hearing and to sound, and also to mind, as tubes formed the memory architecture of the first computers. Artists were instrumental in communicating the promise of science and technology. From the first artistic mashups of the atom and the solar system, artists were helping to shape the expectation that electronics would eventually bring space within our reach. Before the first satellites, it took a leap of faith on the part of both artists and engineers to visualize the ultimate reach into space, the place that electronics would ultimately make possible. The first US satellites launched, of course, in 1958. And in the early years of the satellite age, the motion of the spacecraft around the planet became a new visual synecdoche, standing for the motion of electrons around the nucleus of an atom. And now, a short motion picture interlude while we set up the sky for our trip. from a handmade film about space exploration. The next scale up from the atom is the structure of crystalline materials. Crystal structures made transistors possible, enabling a giant leap in electronics toward space. Scientists grew crystals in laboratories. Here, a crystal garden is both of the planet and not of the planet surrounded by organic forms, but backgrounded by a spiral galaxy with its partner, the atom, overhead. Electron microphotography turned crystal structures into fine art. And the crystal was depicted in surrealist forms here in an oil painting, a still life for Scientific American. The transistor, when it came, was still very small larger than an electron, larger than a crystal surface, and yet artists had to step back and think like engineers. Think about how the transistor existed conceptually before they could begin to visualize it. 
the transistor took over the roles of the vacuum tube and uh, enabled the mini miniaturization of electronics devices, but it itself tended to resist creative stylization. As it turned out for the artists, engineers in this case had made the artwork. Engineers designed the graphic symbol language that they used to communicate with one another about components. Artists then took the engineering symbols and turned them into design icons. Here's a transistor symbol turned into a repeating motif and made into a fine oil painting and surrealized for RCA. This was a book cover for RCA and positioned as a window to the starscape, lest we forget where it's going to take us. The transistor went to market in 1954, and by 1958, when the first US satellites were launched, they were fully transistorized, a very fast transition. Here, the Vanguard satellite's been made transparent by an artist to show off the powerful transformative leap between a tiny miniaturized components within and the satellite's role as a new moon. Telstar was the first active telecommunications satellite in 1962, and satellites themselves, once launched and once operational, became further extensions of human sense perception, first sound, and then vision, an extension that some artists drew like this, and others, like the surrealist Boris Artsy-Bashev, drew like this. And a brief motion picture interlude while our ship is placed on its way to Mars. The cathode ray tube was a companion to the vacuum tube being developed for public use only on a slightly slower calendar. Think of television coming in a little bit after radio. As an extension of the human senses, it corresponds to vision. It exploded the human sense of scale yet further through picture transmission, developing in one direction into television and into video, and in another direction developing into computer monitors. Like vacuum tubes, cathode ray tubes also corresponded to mind. They also contributed to the brains and organs of early computers. This is an ad for a kind of cathode ray tube that stored data within a computer. And computers are, of course, the great silent partners of space exploration. Silent in terms of how the public thinks of them anyway. You don't visualize giant computers 20 or 100 times the size of satellites keeping them up in orbit, but of course they do. No rocket or space station was ever launched, much less guided by it, without a computing array and programmers behind it. It was within computers, even more than within satellites themselves, that the promise of the electron to reach outer space was realized. In computers, the vacuum tube, the cathode ray tube, and the transistor all combined both simultaneously and in series in different machine designs. In fact, Many artists were quite stymied by the question of how to depict the relationship between information technology and space exploration <laughs> because early computers posed a challenge to artists. This was 25 years before computers leapt onto our desktops and became the subjects themselves of great design. Mainframes were sluggish to yield artistic charisma here, a kind of low-budget surrealism links the computer to its origin and the motion of electrons around a nucleus and to outer space. The UNIVAC computers promoted here were used to program early satellite orbital trajectories. Artists tried a few strategies, composite photography, pen and ink, and an abstract modern with a very strangely stylized spacecraft up above. So what kind of satellite or lunar probe is that? Well, it's one designed by artists. But stepping away from depicting computers themselves, artists turn to visual metaphor. Here the abacus stands in for computing processes, or is it a 1959 preview of the iPhone? You tell me. <laughs> a couple of abacuses from mid-century electronics advertisements because they are so beautiful. 
So in the mid 20th century, artists started playing with language, typography as a visual medium. And this artwork was a product of the IBM design department, which at the time was one of the most advanced design labs in the US. IBM was building the first onboard digital computers used in human spaceflight for the Gemini missions, and later IBM 360 ran flight simulations for, for the Apollo programs. So visual artists all over were using typographic forms, but those working with technology had a wider range of forms to draw on. Artists figured out, they figured it out, how to communicate the excitement and possibility of computing by adapting electronic circuit symbols, mathematical symbols, and astronomical symbols to artwork, creating a new and unique variety of graphic art, one that was specific to technology. Poets around the world of the 1950s and 60s discovered numbers as language, partly because of the emergence of math and computing into mainstream society, and they started writing number poetry. In my mind, the countdown to launch is the original number poem. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Those words were spoken by an electronic computer. They are an example of synthetic speech. So engineers, in a synchronistic gesture, taught computers how to speak and how to read at the same time that poets and graphic artists were discovering numbers. This issue of the proceedings of the IRE has articles uh, by Bell Labs engineers about the process of teaching computers to speak and to read, and that was a Bell Labs recording uh, from the IBM design department. Sometimes typographic design represents just binary language, like visual number poetry. It's simple, but it makes the point about computation and service to space exploration. The Surveyor spacecraft, uh, this is an ad for, is a scientific research spacecraft that had the first telemetry-controlled lunar landing, and this ad was to recruit engineers to work on that telemetry. And the surveyor we all know wore a little hat and looked pretty different from this, but uh, this predates the mission itself by five years. And this is a work by Jacqueline Casey, who is the MIT in-house graphic designer from the 60s to the 80s. This is an artistic interpretation of eight engineer-generated data sets. And this is the most sophisticated example of typographic art in the service of space exploration that I've found. Eight distinct columns woven in a tapestry, each showing different kind of elements of the calculations for satellite telemetry. As a history talk, you know the rest of the story from this point in the 1960s. Now we're going to look at some beautiful rockets. We went to the moon, and we're going to go back. This is uh, George Akimoto and uh, Chesley Bonestell, a Frank Tinsley lunar base with a nuclear rocket, a Leskoski chemical rocket, and uh, General Motors, and Willie Baum for Martin. This is art for engineers, a rocket divided into Grecian mathematical proportions. And I leave you here with the thought that both art and engineering begin with handcraft and that space exploration is and will continue to be a handiwork of humankind. And note that our ship has arrived at Mars. And uh, thank you.